simplicity, I guess, of that kind of question and discussion, um, and why I highlight it so much, there was so much emphasis, is that it arises because in the case of all Ray Kingley's books, they're first and foremost perceived as artworks. So it's with this in mind that the question of where to place a text begins. Um, you know, by analogy, perhaps in the same manner in which, let's say, a curator, I mean, this is a sort of notional sense of what a curator might do, but they don't stick the label for the artwork, i.e. the information about it, on top of it. Um, obviously, they, uh, um, the extended caption um, is to the, maybe to, further to the right of the artwork, um, the raw text about the artist or the exhibition near to the entrance of the gallery, and so on and so forth. So sort of location and proximity between object and text and what it's about is all, is all being played out. But what the joy um, of making artists' books brings is, is that there's no gallery wall and there's no entrance. Where a text is located in a book project, therefore, um, when it says how it's written, um, who is it written by, what I want to consider are those kinds of questions in relation to three uh, Ray Kingdom's book projects. Um, asking actually all of you to, to think um, or to consider perhaps in parallel the extent to which ideas of um, critical writing are hinted at or um, hinged upon or are left even to hang in somewhere in a kind of space of abundance in, in these book projects. So to introduce what I want to look at in, in, in the three book projects, I'm going to turn first to another book. Um, it's an uh, excerpt from Saul Bellow's 1956 novel, Seize the Day, um, which I'm showing a slide of here. Um, and I'm just going to read it um, to you because I think it's important to, um, to, to, to kind of comprehend what's being, what, what he's doing, which is where I want to um, look at it a little more closely. So um, when it came to conceiving his, uh, quote, um, when it came to conceiving his troubles, Tommy Wilhelm was not dark, red, uneven carpet, from cupboard to lobby, below toward the woman's feet. In the foreground, the lobby was dark and sleepy, French drapes, like sails, kept out the sun, but three high narrow <coughs> windows were open, and in the blue air, we had saw a pigeon. I put a light on the great chain that supported the marquee of the movie house directly underneath the lobby. For one moment, he heard the wings beating strongly. So this is the first paragraph of the book. It describes the main character, Tommy Wilhelm, on his way to breakfast as he descends in a lift at the Hotel Gloriana. The book, if you go on to read it, and maybe some of you in the audience know it, uh, is about the tumultuous events of one day in the life of Willem, events that will change this man's life forever. And what Bella, 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 the author does here in writing this first paragraph as the introduction in the way that it's placed at the first page does, is to summarize, in fact, the entire contents of the book in the opening paragraph in one simple deft stroke. stroke. It's not without reason, for example, um, that our first introduction to Willem is him descending in a lift, not just any lift, but one that is descending in a hotel, fatefully named Hotel Gloriana. Willem expects the lift to stop on the 14th floor, but he is usually joined by his father, but today the elevator does not stop. A routine on this impending day of events is already broken. This is not going to be normal, a normal day. Moreover, more dramatically, the lift continues to, quote unquote, sink and sink, like a kind of biblical journey. Well, what, where is it going? When it reaches the lobby, the doors open, and the carpet, well, of course, it's red. But not just any red, it's dark, it's uneven. This is going to be the minefield of the day. The location of this text at the start of the book, given the content of the narrative to follow, are inextricable. If the text were in any other location, its meaning would change. By being where it is at the beginning of the book, Bellows, I believe, cleverly uses the descent of the elevator to the ground floor as an analogy for the ill fortune, obviously, that lies ahead of his main character. The character's already fallen before he even steps into the lobby, so to speak. Given what we know about the story, we could go as far as to say the story has already been told before it has been read. I would also like to go as far as to suggest that its location at the front of the book gives it a distance to the rest of the book. This frontality, or this positioning, a 
as being in some kind of emotional sense exterior to what will unfold is also a location that I think is most commonly understood to be the location of criticality. The pointing finger ideas in mind of proximity of closeness and, and, and being far away as I talk or, or, for, or for you to. So the first book project I'd like to look at is by Aisha Khalid, who, is, um, an art who made an artist book called, um, with making names called Name Class Subject Books, which was uh, commissioned in 2010. Um, the project takes the form of a writing exercise book, or a copy book, as they're known in, the, um, in, in South Asia. And these are very simply the kind of books that you um, help children learn to write. They have um, ruled lines that are formatted to correspond to, to, to the, um, what you would say, the metrics of a letter. So most scripts share the notion of a baseline, an imaginary horizon line on which the characters rest. But in the Roman alphabet, the letters include ascenders and descenders, which are measured by the distance the letter rises or falls from the, or from the baseline. However, in Urdu, um, there are no ascenders and descenders. Um, this is the front cover of the book project. This is the back cover. It's a two-sided exercise book. So what I'm showing you here is an example of an Urdu page. Sorry, I don't want to back to front. This is an Urdu page. It's single lines. And this is an example of an English one. So you can see there's more lines in, in, in the copy books. So for the book project, Aisha created a two-sided copy book which involved painting 240 images of lined pages, each one reproduced in the book. Half of the paintings corresponded to the Urdu pages and the other half to English. And what I want to just do here is come out of this and play you a film. Which we made about the book. Um, As a child, uh, I learned how to write in Urdu first and uh, in English only later. I went to government school where the medium of instruction was Urdu. When we were 14, English was introduced. Suddenly so we had a new language thrust at us. Film, the text, is in fact placed inside the project. Um, as everything you heard her say, I, I think, gives a context to the book project and explains some of the ideas that were there for Aisha and, and what informed her creation or the idea to, um, to make this work. And all of that information could, of course, be left out of the book. Um, but the choice to include it came about um, as follows, I guess. Um, as Aisha mentioned, she, um, uh, she remembers uh, her recollection of her, her Urdu textbooks. Um, these are uh, what I'm showing you here. For the single lines, um, as you see, are, were, uh, which are the Urdu pages. Um, that they were poorly printed and, and that margins were um, skewed and that some pages were upside down and uh, some lines were misprinted. Um, and these printers' errors, um, which is what they are, are intentionally present in her paintings. And the front of the book, as I explained, was the English side with the ruled, page, um, the ruled lines and this is, would be the way that the Urdu exercise book would open. And the way that you can find um, obviously any page is going to be, or the way that the book, the dog ear um, works is that you fall on this page quite naturally. So if you come to that page, which is what I'm gonna pass around, you'll see everything that was in her script for the, her film um, was used, um, the dog ear produced um, uh, intentionally, um, you know, this, this, um, this place where we could, um, place this information um, and that's really how the text about the book project written by Aisha found its location um, but by reclaiming the dog ear in this way also meant that the Urdu side of the book project 
in spite of being littered with the printer's errors, was also the location in the book where the words of the artist are located and where the viewer reader's eyes would come to rest as they tried to work out what exactly was going on when they first handled this book. Just as an aside, when this book has been bought by a couple of people, um, you know, via Amazon and places, it comes back to us as, I think there was a problem in the printing. There's, there's nothing in there. Um, and so, you know, there, this, there is, I think, a need to, to understand what's happening in here. And, we've, and that was the way that the text, um, was its location helped to, 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 to pass that information on. Um, the dog ear obviously created this inevitable location, as I say, in which to place the text. But given that the text, um, uh, that, that it's written in English, and it appears in the er other side of the book, I, I think creates also this interruption of sorts in a book that is otherwise very regimentally sort of structured by the segregation to one side of English and to, the, to one side Urdu. And there's two covers, as I point out, performing, if you like, two separate kinds of entrances, quite meta, you know, metaphorically. Um, so you know, there's a question here of does the location of the text in this part of the book suggest that the perceived social mobility of mastering English over one's mother tongue is a mobility that gives some sort of visual expression to what um, earlier in the critical writing ensemble is um, Nida uh, Gauss very eloquently talked about a few days ago. Uh, she raised uh, that it's coming f that we come f not from place necessarily, but we come from language. So in the center of the book, um, this is just showing you the dog, the dog ear. Um, so in the center of the book, um, which looks up at us, um, there is something very physical about thinking that we, with a book, it's, uh, we're looking down on it. And, and here it is looking up at us um, uh, as much as, you know, in a way to evoke, uh, actually part of, or one half of the metaphor used by Nada Raza in her exhibition here in Dhaka, um, especially in relation to the last room that, that Nada has curated where she mentions partition. Um, what we find in the middle of this book is the um, convergence of, of um, the lines from the Urdu to the English across these two pages in terms of um, sort of visual misregistration or graphic interference. Um, which is um, which is like the kind of you know when you see on a TV screen when transmission is lost, and it sort of concretizes the lines of control that partition established. Um, but as mentioned, this book project involved Aisha creating 240 paintings, where each line is created by a controlled stroke of a brush, and it's that calligraphic color, color, uh, stroke of a brush sitting alongside that temporal stroke of time when midnight passes and near as new Indian state is created that I think comes to mind when you come to the middle of that, that book project, um, which is being passed around. Um, the second project I want to show you is by T. Shanathanan. It's called The Incomplete Dombu, which poses as a sort of bureaucratic document, and, and Thombu is a term that was used by the Dutch to describe a public land registry. And the word is, a, um, is not believed to be used actually in any other country outside of Sri Lanka. It's derived from the Greek word tomus, from the Latin word tom, or large book. The Incomplete Thombu uh, covers the subject of tunnel displacement during the civil conflict uh, that took place in Sri Lanka from 1983 to 2009. And though numerous documents of civil civilians from the north and east of Sri Lanka um, have been, um, you know, records of what has happened um, have have been written. Very few have highlighted the personal plights of those involved. And what this project did is it recorded the stories that have removed civilians from their homes and the memories they took with them. Um, the attempt to register, I suppose, in this this book project too is a. a um, is what, there's one document, as I will show you, on top of another, um, mapping out and that, you know, further displacements between what is remembered and what has been taken away and the stories left behind in a conflict that's pretty much torn apart the country. Um, I've, I've 
spoken about this uh, before in an earlier panel, but I just want to read it here. Speaking about Thombu, writer, writer Michael Ondaatje comments, um, looking at the slide that is up now, um, quote, the book startlingly, startlingly begins with an almost unrecognizable map of Sri Lanka until you realize it is upside down with place names and towns pointed, printed the right way up. So Point Pedro and Kodakaman are at natural eye level, while the southern part of the island where the power and narrative voice usually reside are now somewhere to the distant north. In fact, not even on the map. It is off stage. The furthest north or south we get is Vavunia. A key element of Thombu is the way in which it employs a number of parts, drawings, texts, and maps to produce a picture of events surrounding what took place in Jaffna between 83 and 2009. The process of compiling the book project by the artist began with the artist asking people to draw on a piece of paper a ground plan from memory of their house. Following this, the artist wrote a text that recalled part of that conversation, and that appears, I'm showing you here on the right, is the, the ground plan that has been drawn. And on the back of that ground plan, you see um, the text that, um, uh, that, that he's written uh, recalling the conversation. Um, I can read this. Uh, I moved the, the one that I'm showing here, which says, quote, I moved to Colombo after the army occupation of Jaffna. Home is about the moments we shared together as a family. I also remember the vegetation in the garden. I don't know how to express these fleeting memories. It's something you cannot catch hold of. So from there, in between appears a tracing created by an architect interpreting the ground plan, and then appears a drawing, the one I'm showing you, which is done by Shanathanun in response to that encounter. Um, and what I guess is important to say here is that each, each ground plan seeks out a sort of lost landscape, each piece of text of an, an incomplete truth, and each drawing grapples really with the task of imagining what took place. What is produced, however, is derived solely from memory, or more specifically, from the boundaries of what memory can summon and commit to a piece of paper, um, a blank piece of paper, no bigger in size than an exercise book, which is you know, incomparably meager in scale to the magnitude, of course, of what actually took place. Um, and in fact, when the artist put a piece of paper in front of one person, he looked at him and said, my god, oh, my, my house is much bigger than this. Um, together, though, each of the book for um, uh, e each page um, of the book ex um, forms an extended collage. I, I, I like to think of the land um, and its people connecting and undoing with each page turn any attempt to grasp what was once there. In stark contrast to the dislocation or dislocations of all those that figure inside the book, the texts that I mentioned come behind every. Uh, ground plan, record the, the, record the conversation, they appear, importantly, all the way through the book, equally spaced in an episodic fashion. And that ordering is what gives Thombo, I feel, its criticality. On their own, these stories, these texts, these ground plans, these dry pastel drawings, um, uh, they, they, they do not carry any consequence unless they're seen in relationship to one another. And it's this sort of indexical relationship that they have to, to each other within the clutches of what appears to be sort of an official folder that makes them feel meaningful. Um, just showing this slide here, which I can show you more through the demonstration of the book cover coming off and it being a document that, that can be, as it were, placed into this. Um, what feels like an official file, um, formalizing, I suppose, something that um, hasn't so far really been formalized. Um, I'm just showing you here um, the front cover um, of what the artist um, as I say, would like us to imagine this being at some kind of government folder um, where you get the jottings of, you know, um, notes and place names and those kinds of um, things alongside a text, um, which I, I'm not going to read out other than one small portion of it where he says, or it says, 
This project was carried out between January and July 2011. All characters appearing in this work are based on real persons. Any resemblance to fictitious events is purely coincidental. Um, I began uh, this presentation talking about the day in the life of Tommy Wilhelm in regard to Saul Bellow's book. And I want to close by looking at um, the last project, but it's The Speechwriter by Barney Abdi, which is a fictional um, documentary um, presented in the form of 10 flip books, which, um, again, um, I'll pass around, which um, are all contained inside this case. Um, and the 10 flip books follow the day in the life of a retired political speechwriter who is a man surrounded by the memories of his family and his vast collections of um, speeches. He's a creature of habit um, and idiosyncratic kind of behavior um, and, and a reclusive existence you might kind of feel when, when you see he's retired from what we assume to be public service work, as this is what the artist, I think, wants us to imagine. And his connection with the outside world takes the form of a daily broadcast from the comfort of his home, which you can see set up here in front of you across the front covers of the 10 books. It's a chair and a microphone. Passes by now, accustomed to the outside, um, to the perplexing array, I guess, of these loudspeakers, which as you walk through the, as you flick through the books, um, comes to light, are wired to the outside of this house, um, stop to listen um, for a few moments each day, the artists would like us to imagine. As they move on, uh, the speakers continue to broadcast the voice of the speechwriter across the neighborhood. This is the, the kind of narrative that she's imagining in this character. But we can't hear him speak but we witness instead the moment of ultimate freedom and perhaps a sort of the life of a man who formulated in, in terms of the fictionalized character here that what we've already been talking about earlier, the, that opportunistic, the opportunism um, embodied by the, um, the, the um, by Nehru reformism um, in the creation of the nation state, the, the rhetoric, the visions, the dreams, and the declarations of others, um, and the connection between what this man might have said in his service as a speechwriter and what he's saying now is de deliberately left in the air. Um, this muteness is um, of course intentionally playing with the project's homage to silent cinema, which is which started in book form. The, the flick book is, is where cinema, silent cinema began. So alongside the set of flick books, there is a text which appears on the front um, of the book. Um, and the formatting and the layout of the text mimics a, a, a transcript. Um, there's a certain use of a certain typeface. Um, it, it's a, like, as, as it were, an old typewriter. And, um, I'll just read it quickly. I had arranged to spend Tuesday morning with him at his house. I find him crouched on his terrace floor upstairs in the warm sun, fixing a loose wire in his equipment. We slowly walk back indoors. Seated in his study, I ask how he started writing for others. He no longer remembers. Maybe it started in college, he tells me. I wrote a debate for my roommates who spoke well but needed help with framing his ideas. The words, the sentence constructions, and the rhetoric had all come later. I've written them all, campaign speeches, victory speeches, inaugural addresses, and all the rest. Many were broadcast live to the entire nation. Those were my words that reassured and spoke of change and made promises. I made those promises. When I started out, I thought naively that writing for these people would be a good thing. I wrote for them and thought with them for so many years, he says wistfully, while wiping the dust of an old file. But to what use? These ideas were just words for them. These are some of my best pieces. They were never used, he says, holding up a sheaf of papers. I was told that they spoke of more than was needed.
up until now, and that is today, I, I've really seen this um, book project as being about a single character, of course, a speechwriter. But it was only when I came to think about writing this paper and, and critical writing and the books and, and embodying any of that, that I discovered a second character, namely the interviewer, who comes to visit the speechwriter, who we may also imagine as the critic when we think of the conjoining of inter and viewer. But their text appears on the front of the book in that position of exteriority um, that I mentioned at the start of the talk, um, which again in some notional way is where perhaps is where criticism sort of resides at a distance. And this of all the books is, is perhaps the most architectural. Um, if I just open it as I did do there, the way to, to pull out the books is by pushing your finger through here at the back. Um, and what's interesting about this new character that I think I've seen for the first time is that yes, they're on the front and they're this ex in this exterior place, but this person also goes inside. They go to, to interview this um, speechwriter and it introduces, in combination, what I think is a really important part of criticality, which is this idea of intimacy. This person, the he or the she, enters the house, the domestic space. For those that know Barney's work, um, the combination of public and private space is very much something that she, she deals with. Um, but when you look through these uh, flip books also, is that this person enters their ho the house of this man, but also, and I don't know whether this is going to quite work, because I have to kind of do it like this. But they share a cup of tea with him. And I don't know what would be more intimate, a kind of performance between two people, a kind of engagement. And this idea of intimacy, intimacy is lastly what I want to say is being part of critical. It's about a kind of knowledge that I think gets um, transferred only when there is intimacy. Earlier, there was the um, evocation as well through um, uh, uh, what Rosalind had talked about that um, is, it was also as close reading. It's, it's about, again, a proximity to something. So I, I, I'm going to wind up now. I mean, I titled my paper Location, 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 um, which is, of course, um, this real estate. Um, uh, it's their mantra, the real estate um, property brokers um, that purports basically to, uh, to tell us um, that however much you might change where you live or the structure or the layout of the house, etc., it's the location that matters. I don't know what possesses them, of course, to say this thing three times. I have no idea. But it gave me, obviously, a very convenient way to talk about three artists, um, three book projects, and shed light on the fact that while writing is shaped by contexts in which, it is in which it is practiced and where it appears, these book projects, I hope, bring attention to the way in which writing can also shape content by way of their location. Thank you. Thank you, is uh, going to perhaps be addressing something that also connects to some of your issues. Um, I'm interested in the way in which you're creating a centrality to the actual process of structuring um, within printed matter, um, which is often normalized or underexposed. And I'm thinking of structure as being inhabited by political, cultural, or ideological values. So throughout your life, throughout the life of raking leaves, let us say, um, how do the choices that you have made in selecting certain artists uh, connect with the particular questions of location, um, which don't just physically come up in, in the book, but the location of the artist, the location of the work of the artist, um, specifically in Sri Lanka or in a wider set of locations? And how does this talk to geographic, linguistic, or ideological aspects of location. So I think I may have confused you somewhere along the lines. Um, 
you've given us three study cases yeah. somehow, and you've very beautifully gone through um, the very formal positionings of certain things and what they evoke and what they try to reveal and unpack. Um, but I'm also wondering about the location of the artist and how that is seen through in your choice and in the way in which they work um, on that particular project. Or maybe it's not at all. Sort of geopolitics um, of where is the artist from and what Nida um, Kaus, which, I, which is what, what I was speaking, uh, quoting what she had said so beautifully that, um, you know, we can come from language um, as, as, as and to explore that as another kind of location or place. Um, uh, for me, it's always been a very um, useful way to think about um, where an artist is from or um, where when we think, when I think of what Stuart Hall described when he talked about um, the diaspora, in fact, and he talked in, in relation to Europe, and he talked about um, the diaspora being um, not from Europe, but of Europe. That there's a kind of possession that one has of, of, of place that um, I think is where, when, in a way, what you're also asking, Katia, is how do I select the artists, I think? Um, is, is it where they're based? Is that important? Um, and say no, because it, it, it can never, if that is important, then I think the projects are never going to be very interesting. Um, if that's the, the reason for why I'm selecting them. Um, I think the question behind your question is though, where Raking Leaves is concerned is that most of the artists I do work with are all from South Asia. Um, and it's not just Sri Lankan artists. And you know, what began with Raking Leaves for me is a very important strategic um, decision was moving away from curating and, um, or rather moving away from um, making exhibitions where uh, I was able to work in a form um, that allowed me to work with Sri Lankan artists that um, was much more, I felt was going to have um, a greater effect and impact in the, if, if otherwise I was going to wait for exhibitions to take place because, you know, no one was looking at Sri Lankan artists and, and that was also because of what was going on in the country but there was a there wasn't really a great interest. So I was also keen to find a way of working with Sri Lankan artists that um, you know w w allowed them to circulate in, via their projects and ideas in the world that was not just about an exhibition. And alongside that was of course thinking about other artists in the region um, to, to do similar things with that. Years ago uh, that titled itself uh, the global and the intimate, as opposed to, I think, the sort of commonplace juxtaposition of the, the global and the local or something like that. And I was wondering if you could speak, I've been struck actually as I've been listening to the presentations in this room by the juxtaposition of image, text, voice, and presence, and um, noting, of course, the portraits of Mujib and Sheikh Hasina above uh, the speechwriter and then your uh, presentation uh, has been something that I've actually been I mean, not just you your presentation. <laughs> I have, I have. I've actually been thinking about those images, uh, you know, throughout uh, the, uh, the the presentations in this room, and wondering if anyone, uh, whether you or others, might reflect. I think it, there is a kind of specificity uh, to what you might say about the work that you and Raking Leaves are doing in the remaking of, and I know this is going to sound very big, but I think you've already addressed it to some extent, but the remaking of South Asia and the remaking of, of the art world. Um, and uh, whether, uh, how about this? How about I invite you to comment on um, uh, our location here in Taka, in Bangladesh, your work uh, has it, you know, you, you said that you had come across various insights that you hadn't had in relation to the books in preparing for this workshop. And I think some of it was probably in relation to the public that you were addressing here, or that the imagined public that you would address here. So could you say a little bit about how um, the work is circulating um, in South Asia and uh, how you see the work in relation to this venue? How about that, this site, this location? Discussion about writing and, and, and critical, well, critical writing. And I guess what I'm very grateful for, of course, is to be here and to have the, um, uh, the audience 
but grateful too because I've heard from so many other speakers who've been talking about their own work and practices that, 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 that has made me think and reflect on what I do. But you know, sometimes when you're asked to just speak about what you do, uh, like I am asked to speak about raking leaves, it's raking leaves does this, it's funded like this, it's a non-profit, blah, blah. What Katia and Antonia and this context has provided me with is a way to think about what I do with some criticality. And I'm not saying that what, um, you know, I'm not, it, it's allowing me, I guess, an opportunity to be a bit speculative um, across, you know, the these very hesitant kinds of projects. I mean, in a way, Sonal, you say that they're I may, I may have misunderstood what you say. Well, that, is it breaking leaves that you think is, or these projects that are uh, that have this? Are they restructuring? Uh, they're, ve they're very humble projects, you know. They they cost like um, I think this is also important to throw out that they cost twenty five or thirty dollars. They're really affordable things. Um, they're not they're not trying to be high art. Um, it's not a big organization. It's tiny. And um, um, Hamad, who um, I used to um, have the great, you know, pleasure of having to share an office with because he provided me with a desk. Would would always laugh when I'd say raking leaves and talk about we because he goes just you. <laughs> uh, but it's a small thing, and the smallness is so important. And and I think it will um, it will it will die. A, it will die out the moment it gets and it tries to get bigger or is, you know, it, it's, it's about these kind of, what publishing does as well is it's a slow release. It's an exercise of letting something out into the world and such a sort of, um, you know, the distribution of a book, the closeness of it, the way that you come across it, the way you pick it up, it's, it's, it's about a certain kind of decision to, um, just how, you know, how ideas circulate in the world that I think is what's interesting about it. And the moment that I think, in fact, it becomes, um, like, um, it, you know, becomes money in, in any way bigger than that, it's, it's lost track of itself. Um, you know, I couldn't agree more. I think in the interest of full disclosure, I should... Intimacy is really, I think, trying to put out there that, you know, when we're talking about being critical, we have this distance on something, but it's also, I believe, in tandem with an intimacy, like what we call, you know, what was, what Devika really wonderfully just brought to the fore when she said a close reading of something. And it's these two things together that I think I, I'm... It's only what I would imagine to be how one, you know, thinks about in its broadest way, what is it, what, how does one think about criticality or cr being critical? And that, that it encompasses these kind of two, two opposites, however you want to metaphorize them. I think there's another question. But I hope as well, yeah. yeah. Um, how do we think about critica what I'm thinking to myself is how do we think about cr being cr the criticality and what I'm trying to think about is that it's it's about having a distance on something um, to be able to criticize it to be able to look at it to um, to, to, to think about it and that that involves some kind of distance but I'm, I'm saying in tandem with um, an intimacy with it, and that this distance and intimacy, this kind of things come together. Um, so it's those two things I'm saying are together that I'm, I'm just putting out there. The, the commission, um, the why I use the word commission, um, uh, is because it's, 
I mean, it probably is a, job, it's a, a, a kind of terminology that's used when you think about um, when you're asking an artist to make a new artwork, it is called and referred to as a commission. Um, it's, you know, c these are all, um, every single book project is um, the creation of a new work in, in response, as I said, to that just very simple question that it, they all begin with, which is, how would you make an artwork that takes the form of a book that has an inevitability about it as a book. It cannot be anything else. So every sense of what you think about as the artwork is is being lived out in this in this form. And of course, today, you know, there's a few forms that have been explored, but um, there's other projects that have been done where there's there's two books that come together. And, and for the artist, this was Iman Qureshi. He thought about it as well when I show an art when in my when I might show in an exhibition um, two rooms and two bodies of work, how would I do that in book form? So we put two books together. Um, the commission is, it, it's just, I think for me, it's just a technical um, word for describing the, 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 the shorthand way, the, the, the way that the industry, if you like, talks about the, the creation of a new artwork. So I don't know whether that's really what you were asking, Shaka. Um, you know, the, um, the, the co-production, the, the huge, you know, all of the book projects are huge production exercises. Um, um, it, it's just something that isn't, to, yeah, doesn't kind of come, at, come, to come into the way I describe them um, at the start, but, but maybe that should be how they get described. We spoke to a lot of curators who commission artworks. Um, they all work in very different ways, and, and many curators work with an artist where they commission them and, and ask artists, I think, as well. This is really important that some artists, you know, the commissioning process, they're really, they've really involved, if you like, and, and there's a huge amount of other people that um, play roles in it that you might say are collaborative. Uh, that add to the process. Other commissions might be, um, you know, the curator's less involved, or the artist, um, you know, collaborates or has, you know, the, uh, has co-producers um, in, 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 the, in the process of making a work that are not with the curator. Um, but, it, yeah, I, d I don't think it's, I guess it's, a, it's not, no, I never really have to think, I've never spent time thinking about how to define the processes involved so much. It, it hasn't seemed so relevant. But if, if you really want to know about the collab, if the, what, if they're collaborations, then I think one's also talking about the printers, and the designers. And I've talked about this in other um, lectures that those aspects of it are really important. But um, yeah, it, it's not. Um, it's not how they're kind of presented or packaged in the in the from the outset.